My name is Commander Adrian Cavish Jope. Uh, I'm a career F-18 guy, uh, and really have been part of this PE journey for the last two years. So started as Admiral Luckman's chief of staff uh, until uh, late April of this year, where he headed down to the Naval Safety Center. He's still my boss, so I still report to him. But the uh, the peak functions have basically are flowing underneath the underneath the safety center and will remain there for the future. So that's interesting because this was kind of an action team, and I'll talk about it in the slides that come, but the action team was really there to kind of get after the problem, uh, find out what was, what was the issue, uh, and then figure out ways to mitigate it. What we found out after was, after the whole process, there was a whole lot of things that still needed to be done, and you had a lot of resident knowledge that if you kind of got rid of it right away, you wouldn't have it there anymore. And so much so that Airbus and other naval uh, aviation leaders felt like this is something that probably needs to remain uh, resident under the safety center, where is the appropriate place to house it, but have it into the future because peas have been around for a long time. I mean, they've been around since you know we put people in hot air balloons years and years ago, and we've seen it in other platforms. And unfortunately, you know, we may see it in other platforms going forward. But again, all the knowledge and stuff that we're going to impart to you today is stuff that I think will go well into the future uh, of getting after the issues should other platforms uh, see the same things that we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, but also to remain resident amongst the Navy and Marine Corps for the, for the platforms that we're going to talk about today. So the objectives for today, I'm going to give a quick executive overview of, of basically 2017 to now. Uh, I'm going to talk, and then I'm going to pass it over to uh, Mr. Don Solomon and uh, Commander Doc Hoffman. Uh, so Doc uh, Hoffman is from BUMED, head of the Aeromedical Action Team, and, and really we consider the PE flight surgeon. Uh, he and I have been uh, together the entire two years for this process, and a lot of the aeromedical stuff and advances that we've done, it's all thanks to that gentleman sitting there. Uh, Don Solomon here uh, from the PE IPT from PMA 265, he's been with us a lot longer than two years. Uh, but he was a uh, lead for a lot of the efforts in the RCCA uh, for F-18. He's going to talk specifically about some of those RCCA findings, which I think a lot of you are anxious to hear. Uh, and then they're going to do what we call as our aircraft systems and aeromedical discussion, which we have now kind of housed under a PE TED Talk, if you will. And they're going to go back and forth, kind of talking about the systems and talk about how the human interacts with the systems uh, in that aeromedical environment uh, or in the aerospace environment. And, and again, Please ask questions. Stop the brief uh, whenever possible uh, and, and ask those questions. I don't want anybody to leave here without any unanswered questions because this is the opportunity to get that uh, out. So the overview. So we started tracking PEs around 2010 and we started to kind of see a continuous uptick uh, over the course of the years. Uh, and then we saw a tremendous uptick in obviously T-45 in 2017, so much so that we decided to shut down the training pipeline. And I still think, well, I know we're still licking our wounds with that, of trying to get back you know, the TAC air pipeline to where it was uh, and to replenish the fleet with a lot of those aviators that were kind of stopped in their training. So a lot of JOs, uh, probably friends of yours in here, you probably some of you are maybe affected by this. Uh, they're seeing four hour, or I'm sorry, four year tours now to try to make up for that. Uh, so we're getting after it. You know, T-45's getting back on, on their feet. Obviously, they've had some issues with motors since, and I know you guys are probably well aware of that, uh, but we're getting back to where we need to be to kind of get the uh, TAC air, uh, uh, group uh, replenished with the bodies that they need. F-18 did not do a shutdown, but we did see a dramatic uptick in the PEs as well. Uh, and 2017, as you remember, you were seeing PE reports come out, you know, every week there were, you know, two, three, sometimes four times a, re a reports that were coming. Since then, we've seen it fall off, and I'll show some of those charts here uh, in a moment. So PAC fleet uh, under Admiral Swift said, hey, we got to do a comprehensive review on this. We got to figure out what's going on. We're going to look at the aircraft. We're going to look at the human as well. We're going to do a holistic approach. Uh, he he uh, designated that there was going to be a physiological episodes action team that was going to be flag-led. Initially, it was Admiral Clutch Joyner, uh, and she started the effort to go forward and figure out what was going on uh, with this PE uh, hysteria that it was really kind of hitting the fleet uh, and seeing a lot of uh, people being affected. Navair and Boeing, in the meantime, started uh, root cause and corrective action uh, on both aircraft. So they were two independent organizations uh, with various individuals, I believe 100 total individuals, that uh, basically worked separately, um, but in concert with each other, trying to uncover anything they could find with PE, and eventually came up with 567 recommendations. So when you think of uh, you know, a bunch of detectives out there going out and taking every stone and turning it over to find out what's out there, they did that. Uh, and then they basically put all that together uh, using engineering analysis, analysis studies, uh, bridging of DOD, industry, academia, aerospace medicine, 
they were able to culminate that into a report, and those, are those findings that were reported to Naval Aviation leadership in February of this year. Again, that was nearly a three-year uh, effort. Uh, it started back in 2017, and again, was briefed to Airbus, NAVAIR, DCA, Sinatra, all Naval Aviation leadership, February 20th. So here's the Pete from August 2017 to the present. Obviously, we talked about Admiral Clutch Joyner being uh, kind of the belly button initially. Uh, the biggest thing for her was triage. She had to get out on the road and start talking to the fleet and trying to figure out what was going on. Meanwhile, we didn't have a lot of answers. RCCA hadn't really kicked off yet, but RCCA started to do that. Aviators started to carry those little orange slam sticks, which I know all you guys love or hate. Uh, trust me, they work. This will be my first foot stomper. It's really important that they do work. It's very important that your AZs know how to pair that with your MU data because we are getting significant data off that and preventing PEs because of it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, PE Roadshow commences with, uh, with Admiral Clutch Joyner in earnest. A lot of it was looking at the aircraft, but meanwhile, aviators are like, what's going on with me? Uh, we really needed to kind of dig into that. And we've made tremendous progress since uh, as a result of obviously Doc Hoffman's work and a lot of understanding uh, across aerospace medicine. Uh, but it was really a monumental investigative effort uh, that involved a lot of people. And when I think about what the PEAT's main core function was, we really kind of look at liken ourselves as almost like a train conductor uh, or, you know, a switchboard operator. And we're trying to get all the stovepipes to talk to each other. So NAVAIR, the fleet, DOD, industry, academia, aerospace medicine, get everybody to uh, come together to get after the PE effort. Uh, and we've done that. We've had various symposiums. Uh, and we've learned a lot as a result of it uh, and, may, and established some great enduring relationships that I think will last well into the future. So she had the helm until June of 18. Admiral Lucky Luckman uh, took over in June. Uh, as I said, he just recently departed the pattern and went down to his Naval Safety Center, but still very much involved in PE. Uh, but RCCA really started to produce tangible results, uh, and really the kind of the first major uh, domino to fall was the closeout of contamination. Who in here is who? would associate OBOX degrees with potential contamination or ever heard that. Yeah, plenty of flight suits, right? I did too. But again, has nothing to do with contamination. Don Solomon will talk about the OBOX degrade and what it means and how the system works. Uh, but we close that out after some various testing and he's got all the results and we'll be able to answer any of your questions on that. But that was a major shift. Uh, we started to stop talking about histotoxic hypoxia, which was another buzzword that was flowing around the fleet. Um, Hornet Health Assessment Readiness Tool, HART. Okay, so that little orange slam stick. Uh, when paired with MU data uh, and paired correctly, that data is sent down to Orlando to knock TSD. And there's a supercomputer down there that is crunching all these numbers. And we're pulling data analytics off of that. And now we're doing predictive maintenance. So instead of, uh, you know, an MSP or a gripe telling us what to do, and then your know, maintainers go and rip the jet apart, sometimes causing more damage because we don't know. And so we'll try this and we'll try this. And then eventually, hopefully, get the aircraft up. Heart is showing parts failing before the aircraft even registers they're failing. So before an MSP pops, before that gripe comes from air crew. So uh, they could particularly say, hey, your S bar is going bad. The squadron is notified. They'll go and pull the jet in, into, the, uh, into the barn. They'll fix the S bar, get the aircraft back in the fleet, uh, and, and then flying. Now, the amazing thing is pushing the I believe on this. And I think there was a little bit of reticence at first, you know, because it was like, wait, the jet's supposed to tell me this. But we're getting everybody on board now. And fortunately, we have not seen a major pressure PE uh, that's resulted in a significant injury since March of 2019. Uh, sorry, May of 2019. Heart went into effect March 2019 with a pilot program, VFA-213. Subsequently, it spread out through the entire uh, Rhino and Growler fleet, as well as the Legacy fleet. So again, foot stomper, if your slam sticks aren't working, uh, it is really imperative that you do that because it's getting after PE. And again, heart is not just for PE, we found. We're able to start doing targeted maintenance for fuel systems, other systems in the aircraft. This is going to be a great thing for naval aviation readiness and something that came out of this whole PE effort, which we didn't even know about when we started this journey. We had a peak pressure symposium in uh, June of 2019 where we invited uh, a lot of people from academia uh, and uh, aerospace medicine, a lot of big brains. Uh, one of them was uh, Dr. Goldstein from BU, uh, who had the largest brain bank in the world, uh, and he's more often, you know, associated with CTE discussions from the NFL. And so that brain bank has done a lot of that. And we started to kind of look at, uh, you know, going away from what we always classified as decompression sickness. Uh, and Doc will say, will tell you later on, and you guys will believe, while well, DCS is really not what we're dealing with. We always talk about DCS and hypoxia, and that's anything, that's all you've ever been educated. And there's so much more that you're going to be educated on today. 
again, uh, that's going to be part of the knowledge going forward that's going to help you mitigate these things going forward. But what we're really looking at and what we found from that pressure symposium is that we're looking more like a, at a concussion type event and the concussive effects of, of, de, of uh, compression, decompression, uh, where there's rate on uh, duration are potentially causing concussions uh, or a concussive effect in the, in the air crew, a vice, a DCS, if you will. We've also ruled out DCS through some of the studies that we've done uh, at NEDU, so the Navy Experimental Dive Unit down in Panama City, where we actually put people in chambers on a PE profile with a sonogram looking for bubbles and found nothing. So again, another w reason that we're back in this with the science uh, to tell you that it's something else. Uh, and we're kind of looking at this in a different direction. So again, medical knowledge increased overall. The clinical practice guidelines, the CPG, Doc Hoffman had a, a, a big uh, uh, you know, footprint on that. And, and now there's a plan going forward. Originally, as we said, when PEs were kind of going off crazy in 2017, you had friends of yours that were getting hurt and there was taking a long time to get treatment, right? took a long time to get them what they needed. And there was really, there, people were pretty upset, and rightfully so. And if we could go back in time, we knew what we knew now. Gosh, I wish we had all the knowledge then to be able to help them. But the journey has taken us to where we are, uh, where you know, there is a plan ahead. Uh, another thing that Doc Hoffman did was uh, he took all of aerospace medicine uh, and educated them. So you know, if somebody had a PE uh, and they went into a base that didn't have TAC air, they were going to know how to treat them. Okay, and I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, the other stuff uh, for the improvements to PE aviators, uh, we've involved the Tampa Poly Trauma Center for some of our long-term down aviators where we've done some rehabilitation for them. And what I'm happy to tell you right now is there are zero uh, aviators right now that are down long-term for PE. Everybody's on it back on a flight status, and that's good. And a lot of that's part and parcel to what we've established with that relationship down there, and Doc will talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And then, obviously, we had the RCCA closeout brief in February where we briefed all those leaders. Subsequently, we've had a lot of work on our plate. CNAP 3710.7, uh, again, Airbus owned document. A lot of the stuff that we learned through RCCA just wasn't there. We could sit here and tell you to a blue in the face about all the stuff that we've learned about, uh, you know, things that are going to degrade your margin, things other than hypoxia and DCS, but there was no document to support that. We have that now, and it's now in the 3710. We were also adding a mindset shift of right now it's, you know, you, thou shall wear my, thy mask from take off the landing. Not such a good thing. It's good to actually take your mask off every now and then in an appropriate environment below 10K, take some good replenishing breaths uh, and kind of get the system reset. The RAF, uh, the Royal Australian Air Force had tremendous success with that and they dropped their PE rate significantly as a result. We've adopted that to do strategic air breaks uh, and most effectively using the ACBC maneuver, which is your air crew, air crew control breathing cycle, which you will be educated on. The next piece of the human performance high altitude physiology. So great, you're here in the roadshow, but how are we going to get this on an annual basis? So our uh, Pete physiology or AMSO, um, Captain Linderman standing there in the back or sitting there in the back, uh, he put together a very, very lengthy brief that kind of talks about all the stuff that we're talking about today, but to get the AMSO community uh, educated on this so that they could appropriately start educating on an annual basis to talk the new language that you're hearing right now of everything out there other than hypoxia and DCS on how best to uh, effectively manage yourself uh, in that aerospace environment. He spent uh, the month of August educating all of the fleet, so all the AMSOs are done. Airboss said, before I sign this 3710, which he did on September 9th, he's like, I want all the AMSOs speaking the same language. I want all of Naval Aviation leadership uh, briefed on this and with a thumbs up, which we got. Uh, and now AMSOs are going to be ready to train here starting October 1st. So you'll be getting that new uh, brief here whenever you get your annual training going forward. And so this will not be the first time you've heard this. Oh, well, that will be not be the first time you've heard it. The NATOS modifications. We talked about education and awareness. Um, who in here really understands how the OBOX works? It's kind of a really tough question, but you know, you had CBTs is in our in the rag, and it's like turn boxes green, and that was about it. And then there's a bunch of like stuff like, oh, it means contamination, or it means this. Um, there's just no knowledge, so we added a lot of language into the systems chapter of chapter two uh, about the OBOX, how it works, what the OBOX degrade means, what it triggers, uh, when it's triggered, uh, what it can and can't do. And again, that's dispelling a lot of the stuff out there that's just misinformation. Unfortunately, that's led to some of the PEs. And again, Dom will expound, expound upon that during his portion of the brief. We also changed a lot of our procedures and our mindsets based off of what we learned through this process uh, and then put into 3710 and then take it from 3710 into procedures. So OBOX degrade. 
Again, there's been this crazy thing in the past with a pull the green ring, get the oxyphilonome off, initiate the rabbit sample 10K. There's no boldface associated with the F18 OBOGs that we're putting up to the model managers. We had our discussions with the model managers last week, actually, on Thursday. Uh, have some finalization meetings this week, but hoping to have those procedures out into the fleet here in the coming months, as long as it takes for the editors to do, and you know how long processes take. But we're, they're, ex they're going to rapidly put this to the fleet. But again, uh, sitting on an OBOX degrade, we're telling you below 10,000 feet with an OBOX degrade, you can still continue, continue to breathe off that mass because you're not going to get anything less than 21% oxygen. No one knew that before because it just wasn't, the education wasn't out there. Now it's, it's coming out. Again, that's assuming flow is good and you don't have some issue with a valve uh, or some perturbation in the mask. The last piece, the RCC stakeholder monthly closure updates. Uh, where our team is in charge of chairing all those recommendations, so the 567 recommendations that were pared down to 466. Every month we're talking to all the stakeholders, so we have the bridging there. We talked about that conductor thing or, or the, uh, the uh, phone operator. Uh, we're doing that and we're closing those things down all the way to zero. Uh, we're about 50% complete or nearly 50% right now already after three of those monthly meetings. Obviously there's some studies that are going to take a couple of years, but again, we've already spent the money. We're going to take that thing all the way to zero so we can continue mitigating and getting after PE. So where we are rate, I'll just touch on this real quick. Uh, this is kind of showing all of uh, the PE data we've had since 2010, uh, 764 total events. Obviously, saw the rapid increase going into 2017. Uh, we talked about uh, everything that happened then. But really where I kind of want to draw your attention to is the beginning of 2019. And we see a rapid decline in PE. And we think we have a pretty good idea of why that's happened. Heart is one of them. And I talked about that at nauseum and the importance of your slam stick. So third and final foot stomp. The PE reporting instruction we revamped. Who here remembers doing a PE report and you had to pull from a whole bunch of different documents? We've now consolidated that into one document now, so it's a lot easier to follow. We're getting better reporting as a result. The clinical practice guidelines have changed, so we're pulling the right data. We're getting more informative reports, and we're not just putting out nebulous, hypoxic-like symptoms as much as we used to. Uh, so again, this is a good thing for PE. And the last thing is a revamp Rocho, but we started involving the docs, which we didn't do before. And that was the most important part, was to bridge the gap there, to get the confidence back between that kind of trainer and, and athlete, to get the athlete back on the field. Uh, and so we've got that rebuilt, and again, a lot of that's thank, thankful to uh, Doc Hoffman here. Um, so all very important stuff. We also took the roadshow down to the ready room. Again, we're not in a ready room right now, so this is a modified PE chalk talk. Uh, but we found that the ready room environment, and that was a recommendation by one of our long-term down PE aviators, was get out of the auditorium and get down to the ready rooms. People are more comfortable to talk. They're more, more probably able to ask a question and walk away feeling like, okay, I, I'm, I've got this now and, I, and, I, and I, I believe what you guys are putting out. So found success and you guys are getting uh, a little bit of that today. Uh, so the current 12 month PE rate is about one PE and uh, nearly 4,500 sorties. So what we're trying to tell you is be confident in the aircraft. We're doing a lot of good stuff on the pressure side of the house. Education is gonna help a lot with the AOS side of the house. The OBOX is a, is a great system. Do we need to do some improvements to our flight gear? Yeah, and that's coming as well. Here's the Type Model Series, series PE reports, um, peak versus today. Uh, the big numbers that I'll, I'll point to is look at pressure. We're down 86% since we started tracking this. Uh, we're down 74 overall, and then breathing gas, another, we're 74. So a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit higher than we'd like. Obviously, we want these things to be 100% you know, down, and we'll never get there. But uh, we want to bring it down to as close to zero PE reports as we possibly can. This is Hart, uh, and since its inception in March of 2019 with the pilot program, you, know, you see a huge pressure decline here, um, which, is, which is all good news. T45, similar chart, uh, more drastic decline. Uh, T45, a little bit different than F18. Again, you'll find that F18 was a stacking of things that we found that kind of led to PEs. We didn't really find the smoking gun in the aircraft that caused PEs, either on the pressure side or AOS side. T45, they're dealing with flow issues in the OBOGs. We tweaked the engine uh, idle RPM 1.5% to increase flow at low, uh, low throttle settings at high altitudes. We also kind of straightened out a pipe that had a bend in it to kind of clean off some of the perturbations and some of the flow issues that they were having to add a little bit more pressure to the system. Again, that, that led to uh, excellent effects. We saw a drastic drop since the uh, return to flight with Sinatra. We're, we're, we're very rarely seeing PEs anymore, uh, one every few months, if that, maybe one even every six months now. So. Again, good news story for T45 and good news for naval aviation. So key takeaways, uh, physiological events are 
and remain naval aviation number safety priority. Maybe not quite on the radar as much with Airbus uh, and other naval aviation flag leadership as it was once, you know, obviously with the fleet as well. And that's a good thing. But again, the focus is still there, and that's why there's still money being thrown at this, and why the RCCA process is going to be closed the entire way with all of their recommendations. Uh, P rates continue to fall, both pressure and non-pressure. Hearts directly being contributed to our drop and decline in pressure-related PEs. The AOS stuff, those documents that I talked about with the NATOPS of 3710, the annual training, the understanding and education of how your body works and interacts with the aerospace uh, environment, that's going to be part and parcel, I think, into continuing to decline that AOS type PE. Again, all trying to get this to down close to zero as we possibly can. Bottom line, knowledge, proper execution is our frontline defense against PEs, and that's why we're standing in front of you here today. So again, please ask, ask any questions that you have as we go through this day. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass off the reins to uh, Mr. Don Solomon and uh, Commander Doc Hoffman. Before we start talking about the root cause investigation, uh, just some numbers to show you guys how seriously the NAE took this. Um, it was about three years from inception, so we kicked off in about April of 2017 with F-18 and T-45, involved a lot of personnel. At the end of it, we had generated about 8,000 pages of technical documentation getting at this problem. We made 567 recommendations to mitigate the issues. Why isn't it just one or two? Well, you know, with F-18 and T-45, there was no singular ECP we could drive to fix the problem on the aircraft. It's a stacking of a lot of little things, especially in F-18. Uh, in terms of pure dollars, because that's what leadership really cares about, uh, they were very serious. For our rdt &E budget alone for T-45 and F-18, they com committed $50 million to support the investigations. For our FIDIPS, which you'll learn when you get to a PMA, uh, which is the out years money that we're going to have to spend on corrective actions, it's over a half a billion dollars uh, uh, across both platforms for corrective actions. So very serious. And you can see over here logos of just who all was involved. So as Catfish said, it was DOD, it was academia, uh, and it was our industry partners. Uh, let's just give you an idea of this, the scope uh, of testing that we had undertaken. It wasn't just a couple of uh, awesome engineers at NAVAIR sitting in a room thinking about what the problem was. Uh, we went to multiple places of excellence, such as Naval Experimental Dive Unit in Panama City. Um, we had the cabin pressure test lab out in North Island. Uh, additionally, we partnered with the Royal Australian Air Force who did a bunch of testing for us and were uh, deeply invested in getting at this issue. So a lot of folks came together uh, and were coordinated to uh, drive the RCCA to completion. I'll give you the key takeaways. As Catfish said, PEs are not caused by contamination. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, PEs are not caused by hypoxic hypoxia in the traditional sense. So what I mean by that is if you're flying at high altitude with your mask off, you can absolutely get hypoxic. I can't help you. But in terms of the aircraft system doing something mysterious to get you sick, uh, that's just not reasonable or plausible. Um, PEs are not caused by decompression sickness. So aviation DCS doesn't happen until you get to very high altitudes. We have cabin pressure fluctuations. Uh, those can cause trauma, like barotrauma. Those can cause discomfort. But in terms of uh, decompression sickness, we're just not seeing that. PEs are complex and multifactorial. Again, you know, we couldn't just do a single ECP to fix the airframe to make this problem go away. So uh, no fundamental design flaw in the environmental control system or the aviation uh, oxygen system or aircraft oxygen system. Uh, a lot of what we found were reliability improvements that we have to make and uh, uh, the fact that maintenance was failing us and not in terms of the wrench turners on the ground, they're included, uh, but life cycle maintenance from a 10,000 foot perspective, especially at the PMA level. Uh, the human machine interface is contributory and complex. The aircraft doesn't come back sick. Aircraft don't have PEs, the humans do. And that's why it's so important that when we started this uh, root cause corrective action that we were tied at the hip with uh, the aeromedical professionals who could do their job of evaluating the human while the engineers and scientists evaluated the aircraft. And then lastly, uh, training is contributory. Uh, there's not a ton of knowledge out there about high altitude, high performance flight that are resident in our aviators and our flight surgeons. And so that can be especially confounding for a, a junior flight surgeon rendering a differential on somebody when all they've ever heard is hypoxia or DCS. So we're gonna talk about what else it could be. Uh, good afternoon, I'm uh, Doc Hoffman, the head of aerospace medicine at the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery in Falls Church, Virginia. Um, and uh, I have been on the PE, uh, the PEAT, for about the last two years. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the major things that we've done in the last two years. So 
Um, when I first got on the team, everyone talked about PE as just one general syndromic type event. Um, so I kind of went with that for a while, and then the more I got into it and the more I understood about the actual aircraft malfunctions that were happening, um, from a medical standpoint, you're really looking at kind of two um, mechanisms of injury. So in medicine, we're looking at uh, if, you, if you have a, a fracture in, in one of your bones, we want to know the mechanism of injury, and then if that fits the fracture pattern, then we know that's probably the cause, or maybe it's something else. Else, And there's something called pathological fractures, which means that you have some uh, metabolic or um, chemical uh, imbalance that's causing your bones to be weak, and that, that fracture pattern is very distinct. So again, the mechanism of injury was important, um, and we saw that there's two main systems in the aircraft that were malfunctioning during PEs, and that's the uh, air oxygen system, uh, and then the ECS system, so the pressurization system. And if you think about it from a, a medical standpoint, pressurization or pressure fluctuations are pretty much energy waves, right? I mean, that's how sound is promulgated. So that's one type of mechanism of injury that has nothing to do with how we breathe. Um, it, can, it can hurt that system, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect gas exchange. So if, you're, if, you're, if your oxygen system is malfunctioning or it's causing you to breathe irregularly, so we'll talk about breathing dynamics, that can really upset the balances in your body and uh, in, in three different areas. So as we talk, uh, we want you to think about these three things that really, really affect your body. CO2, O2, and your blood pH. Okay, those are kind of the three tenets that when we talk about the air oxygen system and if it's malfunctioning or part of your flight gear is malfunctioning, these are the three parameters that are basically ruling your world. And if they get really out of whack, they will cause symptoms. There's nothing you're doing that's changing it. It's what's happening to you in that cockpit environment. So um, we, that was our thoughts. We actually did some research to back up that theory. We took three years of PE data, and we, we took uh, what we already knew of what was failing, and we split the data into two camps, uh, pressure and non-pressure. And then we looked at all the patients and all the symptoms and medical issues they had, and, and sure enough, they split out into two nice groups that aligned with the mechanism of injury, which is the failing of the aircraft. So there was a certain set of symptoms that were statistically significant with uh, ECS failures and a certain set of symptoms that were statistically significant with the breathing gas failures. The one thing that we didn't realize is that every single aviator who had long-term symptoms or medical issues, 100% of them, not 99, but 100% of them, all were from multiple ECS system failure PEs. So that really was like, okay, so now we have something that's actually really dangerous, and then we have another set of PEs that are very easy to get over, the body can handle it, not that big of a deal, but let's figure out why that's happening as well. Um, and that led us down two distinct medical pathways. Um, and so that's why now we think of PE, especially in the medical world, as two things, breathing related and then pressure related. And the pressure related is the ones that we're really concerned about and the great news is that when heart came out for maintenance, uh, that mitigated the really bad one, pressure PE. So those are down, like we said, 86%. Um, what we used to do is we thought, because you know, what is some of your EPs and NATOPs? It talks about DCS and hypoxia is all the same thing, right? So truly, when you have a true rapid decompression at any flight level, hypoxia is your concern. But DCS is not always a concern, and that's when you get the nitrogen bubbles coming out of your blood, producing an embolic effect, and then giving you symptoms that can be anywhere from joint pain to muscle pain, all the way up to almost like a stroke, depending on what kind of event you have. But that's one of the reasons people were saying, oh, I need to go to a chamber, because this is low-level DCS. That's why we did some of the studies that were just talked about at uh, Naval Experimental Dive Unit and others, because we're like, is that possible? Because if you do the if you do the theoretical math and you look at the physics, it shouldn't be possible. Um, so we actually did that. We didn't find any evidence of it, of it. So it's like, what else could it be? And we'll get into that a little later in the brief, but we were able to show that it's not DCS. And actually the treatment, the chamber, all the people who were having ECS PEs who went to the chamber, while they felt better, it didn't resolve any of their actual physical deficits. And those were in the vestibular and ocular motor world. So feeling better is not the same as getting better. Um, so we, we haven't had someone go to the chamber from a PE in, in a long, long time. Um, that's just not something we do for people. Um, 
case management and long-term care. So we're not sending it to the chamber. What are we doing? What we found out uh, is if you get, you know, we'll talk about the story, but the, the last detail is that this is more of a concussive effect. So like in the NFL, when you take a really bad hit, any energy transference to the brain can cause inflammation and problems, uh, whether that's pressure or physical trauma with a bat. Any energy transference can cause that. So it's also cumulative. So if you've had multiple events, if you've sat in an aircraft where the ECS system has malfunctioned for 90 minutes and just does this, it just keeps hitting you over and over and over again. So I can take a baseball bat and whack your shin really hard one time, and you're going to feel it and probably try to take the bat and beat me with it because you're really upset. But I can also sit there 100 times and just tap away at your shin. And eventually, the same effect will occur, in inflammation at that site. So if you kind of think of it along those lines. What we did is we found the, world, the U.S.'s best polytrauma rehabilitation center that takes care of concussive and TBI patients. That's the Tampa VA. Uh, it's a massive institution. They have an amazing team there, and they do a three-week inpatient evaluation and treatment, and then they will treat you basically until you are, are deficit-free back to baseline. And that's what we did with every PE aviator who had chronic symptoms, every one of them. And we gave them a chance to go. Um, and some of them actually went back twice. And the good news is that all of them now are back up in flight status. So when we got there two years ago, there was a pool of people who were like, you know, I've, I've had... One of them had four PEs, I, I, I can't fly again, I've got all these issues. And we're like, we thought it was DCS, they went to the chamber, that didn't work. Okay, now let's, let's, let's fix what we know is going on now. We sent them to the center and that person's back up in flight status as well, even after four pressure related PEs. Uh, and their symptoms are greatly improved. Um, so that is the long term goal is to get you back up in a flight status. That mechanism now um, at 72 hours after a PE, if you're still symptomatic and it's an ECS-related PE and it matches that concussive effect, then you're going straight to a specialist. There's no more waiting a week, waiting a month, let's see how you do. Because that was one of the frustrating things, right, is when people had PEs a few years ago, it was like, well, the doc's not taking it seriously or there's, you know, I need to get better care. I'm, I'm in Pax River. Where's the Pax River Naval Hospital? There isn't one. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world now. BUMED has an agreement with Tampa, Tampa VA. We will get you in there immediately. Uh, and uh, they are just amazing, and they've done uh, amazing things. Um, we, we could do a whole brief just on those cases, but we'll show you some of the results of those at the very end of the brief. Who can tell me what symptoms of a PE look like, feel like? Lightheadedness. Lightheadedness. OK. And I'll just put lightness, headache, concentration, irritability, irritability. What else? Tangling. Oh, that's a good one. Blue fingers. Is that cyanosis? Yeah. I'll put the fancy word. And hopefully, you guys want to ask questions and interact because it makes it awesome. All right, so what do you think the causes of these symptoms could be? I'll, I'll put one up there, everybody knows, hypoxia. And, and initially, we thought it was a cause, right? So is there one thing that could potentially cause all of those things? Maybe. What other, what other causes do you guys think there could be? Nutrition. Nutrition. Good one. Fatigue, hydration, yeah. Yeah. What else? Sleep, we'll just call it fatigue. Stress. Stress, that's a good one. Any others? Okay, I'll quit beating up on you guys. Um, you can see that there's a lot of different symptoms, and we think that there's a lot of different causes, and that would make it very difficult to discern uh, what's actually going on in the aircraft, especially since we don't have physiological monitoring. So what the RCCA had to do was figure out this. I've got all of these different symptoms. I've got all of these potential mechanisms. What could be really going on? Does anybody know what hypocapnia or hypercapnia is? Okay, we'll, we'll explain what that is. 
Um, but it made it exceedingly difficult, and that's why it took so long, because it's a complex problem. It's not uh, you know, a standard, hey, we're going to do the Famica because we're great engineers and figure out what the end effects are, and if we just fix this little part, it's going to fix everything. When you're dealing with a human and uh, the manifestation of these different symptoms in a high-performance, high-altitude environment makes it very difficult to tease out what's actually going on. So we just talked about some of the symptoms, the causes. You hit the nails on the head. Um, from a medical standpoint, when we started looking at these into two different categories, breathing gas and uh, pressure-related, um, we really wanted to go back to the beginning and look at this as an occupational risk factor, right? You have an occupation, your aviators, air crew. So sitting here in this auditorium, there's a certain environment you're in, right? There's a certain um, partial pressure of oxygen. There's a certain temperature, um, you know, pretty low key, you know, just sitting there relaxing. Uh, but each one of you bring in your own level of hydration, sleep, um, you know, physical fitness. Uh, uh, are you hypoglycemic? Are you hyperglycemic? Let's hope not, uh, especially if you're in flight status, uh, either of those things. But what is it that is changing when you get into the cockpit? And is it good and bad? And how does it affect you, right? So what we do know is that one of the worst things you can be getting into a cockpit of any type uh, is being dehydrated. And how many of you have ever tactically dehydrated so you don't have to pee in the cockpit? Dehydration is probably the biggest thing that you can do to put yourself in a negative physiologic margin. Because the cockpit environment is not normal, and it's not positive, it's a negative. So you have to have a certain physiologic margin to overcome that. Now, you get certain things like 94% oxygen, um, you know, sp flight status, you're at a different physical fitness standard than the rest of the Navy. There's certain medical things you cannot have and go fly with, right? Uh, but you can be an active duty service member, you just can't fly. So that's, we're trying to make sure you have the certain capability to have that compensation mechanism and the physiologic margins to fly in this negative environment. So this is one you can easily mitigate on your own, but there's things in the cockpit that actually cause that. What's one of them? Is the breathing gas. Is there any humidity in there? No, but when you exhale, you get rid of water, right? So over time, the longer the flight, the worse that gets. Just a one hour flight can get you to mild de dehydration if you don't drink during the entire flight. Because you're also, it's also an aerobic activity, right? You're pulling G's, it's not, you're not just sitting there watching TV. Um, at least not unless you're flying commercial. But uh, the flight gear, does that cause you to have better breathing or does it restrict breathing? It's restrictive, right? So that, that's gonna increase your breathing rate. Mask breathing, who loves the mask? Who would love to have a mask on that's even worse and more restrictive than what you're wearing now? You know, put on your, uh, your, your flight gear and say, I don't need my COVID mask. I'm going to wear my flight gear mask. I don't think anyone would, would volunteer for that. But that's going to increase your breathing rate, right? And make the work of breathing harder. Breathing gas, we mentioned it, 94%. That causes vasoconstriction, so less blood to your brain. And it's causing dehydration because there's no humidity in it. Sitting position. That's collapsing the lower part of your lungs. You're losing lung volume. So the upper part and mid part of your lungs have to work more efficiently and better. Um, that's called atelectasis. If you're flying in a dynamic flight, pulling Gs, that's going to cause acceleration atelectasis. Again, loss of more lung volume. Um, and it's going to displace some of your blood down into your legs, right? That's why you do the uh, certain hick maneuver to get that blood back up uh, towards your brain. Altitude. The percentage of oxygen is the same at every flight level, but is the partial pressure? No. That's why you're breathing the, the gas at 94%. But that's, that's a stressor, and that causes all these other things. And then there's human factors, and we talked about that. One of them is the level of hydration, nutrition, you know, your fitness level, how much sleep you got, what's going on at home. You know? are you on a, are, are you, did you just come off the Ike where they were at sea for, what, 10 months? You know, do you think any of them wished they could have been back at home with their families or, you know, if there's something that happened at home, maybe they could have gone back there and uh, helped out, helped out their loved one with their child who may have been sick. Those are all things that uh, factor into it. But those are all the things that happen to you involuntarily. You can control dehydration and some of that and the human factors, but those are all the, it's a negative occupational environment that we had to look at to say, this is the current baseline these are the symptoms you're having. So how are they getting from A to B? And we'll go into that.
but just remember those are the baselines and how do each of these affect your carbon dioxide level, your oxygen level, and your pH. And then because physiologic events by definition from the safety center are aircraft malfunction and you're symptomatic, there's another category called uh, physiological episodes, right, where you just have symptoms in flight. We're talking about physiological events. So the aircraft is always in some way causal or associated with the symptoms being produced. It's not always causal, but sometimes it's just associated. But you can have environmental factors, aeromedical factors we talked about, a medication you're on, if you have a waiver for a condition that maybe makes your physiologic margins still safe to fly, but not as good as they were uh, the day you were born. There's always some component of you that is going to have one of these three spheres that's going to affect you to make you more likely to have symptoms in flight. Sometimes a really bad ECS failure, it's just going to be the aircraft. But the vast majority of PEs, there's going to be an environmental and aeromedical aspect along with the aircraft, and it all works together to cause eventually symptoms uh, in the aircraft or immediately after a flight. This should get your guys blood pumping. Oh yeah, block <laughs> diagram. So how did we solve this problem? We used what's called the root cause corrective action process, RCCA. Uh, we took it from what they did on F-22. Does anybody remember F-22 having PE issues? So Boeing and the Air Force got together. Um, they figured out a way to get at the issue. It took them two years along with a six month stand down. It was a kind of a national security issue with the Raptors. And we took that process and we made it better because we're the Navy and we applied it to the F-18 and T-45 efforts. Uh, typically when you do an RCCA like this, this is a root cause tool of last resort. Uh, it means everything else has failed before you embark on one of these because it's extremely resource intensive and it takes a lot of time because you literally turn over every stone that could be associated with the problem. So at the end of the investigation for F-18, our failure tree that we had built out, which is one of the tools we used to think about the problem, was over uh, 600 endpoints. And that wasn't including all of the chemicals that we had looked at in the context of contamination, which was another 1,800. So essentially how this works is at the top, you have a bunch of data that's typically generated by engineering and scientists. And here on the left, you have the aeromedical professionals that come in and they looked at the air crew like they would a patient. And when you drive intersections of this, we were able to start saying uh, uh, what was reasonable and plausible and what was not. So we asked ourselves for the syndrome to have manifested, whether that's hypoxia or hypercapnia or, or uh, hypoglycemia, what did the aircraft or the environment have to do for that condition to be true? And the best way to think about it is for contamination. So we gathered a bunch of data. We had people flying around all the world, uh, you know, sucking out the contaminants, uh, running it on the, uh, the machines to take a look at what was actually there. Concurrently, we had uh, two panels of doctors, one uh, independent panel of toxicologists, another one of uh, multidisciplinary experts who were looking at things like symptom onset, symptom recovery, uh, what were their medical preconditions uh, to be able to render a, a confidence level for the differential that they generated. And we brought that information together, we were able to say none of these syndromes we've identified look and smell like exposure to a CNS depressant. And that was also backed up by the fact that what we were measuring was in very low levels. It was in the parts per billion. We took that equipment and we took it to John Hopkins University and we did uncertainty testing on it to make sure that we did our homework right, that our, our measurements were accurate. Turns out when you measure nothing, you take the uncertainty of nothing, there is still nothing. And that's why we're able to confidently say that contamination is not a player when it comes to naval aviation PEs. And that's both for F-18 and T-45. So what was the, uh, does anybody remember what the biggest theory for contamination was? What was the most plausible one? They said this has got to be responsible for uh, low level hypoxia-like symptoms. What's that, carbon monoxide? Uh, hydrocarbons. Hi yep, the hydrocarbons. I hear carbon monoxide. Yep, carbon monoxide. So that was a big one, and uh, we, we definitely ruled out hydrocarbons as well. Uh, but carbon monoxide was one of the biggest ones I always heard when I went to system safety working groups. It's why we uh, did the sieve bed catalyst upgrade for the OBOX to scrub it out. So back in 2009, they did some uh, tip to tail testing uh, to be carrier representative. Um, so basically, if you were sitting in this jet, uh, getting the exhaust from another one, 
what would the environment look like? What would the output look like from the OBOGs? So anybody want to take a wager at what the surrounding area around the aircraft looked like in terms of parts per million for CO? Okay, so it was 243 ppm. This is what your, uh, your ABHs, your ABFs are breathing for 17 hours a day out on a carrier, right? What do you think the outlet of the OBOGs was? It was 72 ppm. It sounds terrible, right? I don't want to breathe that. So we said, oh gosh, 72 ppm, that's not good. We need to do the sieve bed upgrade. And so when we did that, um, what do you think it dropped this value down to? 0.3. It doesn't sound bad. I used to smoke. Don't anymore. Um, what am I missing up here? Right? I've got a magnitude, but what am I missing? A duration, right? So we'll just say times some sort of duration. Now this is just Navier engineers looking at it, right? With the RCCA, we brought folks in who are specialists in this type of stuff for, for uh, occupational exposure to toxicants or aerospace toxicology. What do you think you have to be exposed to um, from a clinically validated model perspective in order for you to start driving up your carboxyhemoglobin values up? To where it becomes clinically significant, where you start having symptoms. Oh, I heard you say it back there. A thousand ppm for 40 minutes. That's pretty significant. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, is that carbon monoxide, which was the theory du jour for a long time, uh, was never really a player, even with the old sieve bed. How many of you guys, uh, what's cleaner, locks or OBOX? You should always hear, hey, if we went back to locks, we wouldn't have PE problems anymore. OBOX is cleaner than locks. There's a lot of uh, coolants that they have to use to make that liquid oxygen. Uh, when it comes off the line, there's a, a certain threshold minimum that uh, is in the, the tens of ppm for just nastiness that they say it's okay for you to breathe. OBOX is the cleanest air you're ever gonna breathe in the world because um, it does such a good job. It was never really designed to scrub out contaminants, but when you look at a functional OBOGS unit and they've done the testing on it, uh, the number is extremely low uh, by orders of magnitude of what LOX is. So uh, OBOGS is definitely the cleanest air you're gonna breathe. So hopefully that got rid of that myth. So um, the other work that we did for closing out contamination, I talked about it. Um, we had 21,000 samples uh, of different, you know, sorbent tubes, uh, HCD t detectors, or hi uh, hydrocarbon detectors. Uh, we had SUMA canisters. We had octopi things that plugged in the aircraft and sucked everything out. Uh, we got to about 1,800 compounds that we put in a thing called a molecular characterization matrix. So that's kind of a gap analysis tool where we looked at what was on the aircraft. We calculated time-weighted average exposures, et cetera. And we looked at limits that had been developed prior for things like the F-22 investigation or NASA limits. And uh, we did this at 20 different locations in the United States. I personally took a team out to the Carl Vinson um, to do uh, a couple days underway with them so we could do measurements in different parts of the carrier and the aircraft. I used to be in the Navy, reminded me why I don't want to go back to a boat ever again. And so uh, we took all that information, we pulled it all together, we gave it to those toxicologists, we double checked our homework with uh, the uncertainty testing that we did, and then we said, uh, hey, toxicologists, could you figure out what a risk exposure looks like? So they calculate what's called a hazard index. Right, so it's a way to quantify risk exposure for a one hour time period. And the, the, real, the real special number is if you get to one. If you're above one, that's when they're gonna start saying, hey, I don't think this is really great. So we would sum up all of the compounds that we found, and you can see it's still pretty low. You're nowhere near one. If I got just a massive slug of the, the methyl ethyl death. What can happen is irritation. Has, have any of you guys ever done in-flight refueling? I know it's a dumb question, but yeah. Has your eyes burned? What about sitting and getting the exhaust in? That's possible, right? That's an irritant. That's not a central nervous system depressant, which is what we would say would cause the, the low-level hypoxia-like symptoms. Irritants are a fact of life. I know when I used to refuel uh, helicopters as an air crewman in the South China Sea, I would stand by the exhaust of the 60 because it was warm, but my eyes would be watering. It was a trade-off I was willing to make because it was so cold. So hopefully that gives you guys the warm and fuzzy that I can you know, up here confidently say contamination isn't the issue. 
Uh, it's because there's a lot of uh, resources that went into determining that question. You're not going to get weird smells and stuff come through the O-Box. It does an excellent job of scrubbing that out. You got a poor mask fit. It's a possibility you could smell the fuel. Um, and the ECS louvers, you know, we don't do anything to scrub the air as it's coming from the bleed pressure section of the aircraft into the cabin. Um, so your mask is your, your good place to be if you're doing in-flight refueling and stuff like that uh, to prevent, you know, the irritants from coming in. What's another thing uh, that I haven't talked about that's an additional protection afforded against you for contamination? What is the cabin constantly doing? What, right now, uh, true or false, we have HVAC rules for exchange of air. Right? There's air constantly coming in. There's a leakage rate that you have to have based on the number of people that are supposed to occupy that room, et cetera. So we don't all outbreathe you know, CO2 and make ourselves um, uh, suffer from hypercarbia or for whatever reason. Uh, your cabin refi refreshes very quickly. In fact, the in entire volume of air is exchanged in about 90 seconds. So I would have to have some sort of uh, mysterious source of methyl ethyl death, a large amount of it, and uh, for a duration of a long time with your mask off in order to get you sick from a contaminant. Any questions on contamination? Okay. So next uh, pop quiz. Who can explain the difference between the fractional content of oxygen and the partial pressure? No takers? Okay. So uh, fractional content of oxygen is basically a percentage of the air. We always hear the number 21%. That's what we breathe at sea level, right? And 78% nitron or nitrogen, and there's trace gases and water vapor. And uh, I forget the number, but when is it change? It's like 25,000 feet. It changes, right, from 21%? Yeah? Does it? Sure. Alan already gave you the answer. It doesn't. Um, when do you think the, the percentage of oxygen changes? Not till you get much higher than you guys can fly. A raptor can't even fly that high. Uh, it's 21% all the way, right? What does change, though, is the partial pressure of oxygen. So the proportions stay the same, but the number of molecules drop off. And that's what this looks like. As you go up in atmosphere, the proportion stays the same. You're breathing 21% at 50,000 feet. However, the number of molecules drops off. Okay? And that's really important. That's why we have uh, life support systems in the aircraft, because you can't survive at 50,000 feet for very long, seconds. So what we do is, is we do one of two things. We can either boost the pressure of the air being delivered to you, but that isn't very comfortable for very long, right? Or we change the proportion of oxygen in the air. And that's what your OBOGS does. Does anybody know how the OBOGS works? Okay, so the OBOGS essentially concentrates oxygen. It's not a chemical process. The OBOGS has two canisters in there, uh, and they contain a material called zeolite. And what zeolite's job is, is it it, uh, it binds to the O2 that's coming through, and we use a, a pressure differential to discharge the nitrogen, and that concentrated air is what's sent to your mask. And when it concentrates, it ups the number, the proportion of O2 molecules in there. Okay? And that's how we're able to sustain uh, uh, flight at very high altitudes. Any questions on that? You guys are TPS guys. You got it. So these are what your O2 requirements sort of look like. Um, and this is uh, definitely probably interesting to most folks. Well, what do you think the OBOG's output is generally? It's very high. So typically the OBOG strives to make 90 to 94% O2. It doesn't always do that. It changes based on supply and demand. Um, but typically for F-18s and T-45s, that's the output that you're looking at. You notice it's way more than what you actually need, physiologically speaking. And this line here, has ever, anybody ever heard of a Crew 99? You know what that is, the box, right? <laughs> All right, so you have an O2 monitor, and this is set conservatively. If I took a Crew 99 and I exposed it to room air in here, what do you think would happen? Would I write a no-box degrade or not? You, I see some head nods, yes, we're, we're getting warmer. Yes, you would write a no-box degrade if you were to expose it to ambient air, because it's actually set at 23.9% fractional content of oxygen. 
So you have some buffer in the system when you get that OBOX degrade. And so um, but we've done that intentionally. And that's a good way to design a system because we give you adequate time to execute your uh, emergency procedures. So I'm going to need your guys' help. And uh, I want you to tell me, or maybe I'll tell you, uh, the AOS system layout from a top level. What do you think it looks like? We've got the OBOGs. There's bleed pressure coming in. It's doing its cool thing of pressure swing adsorption. What do you think comes next? There's a tap off for the Crew 99, right? It's going to tell you if it's good air or not. And then where do you think it goes from there? You guys ever see like a mysterious cylinder in your aircraft? You wonder what that is? Plenum. All right. For for a bonus point, um, and you'll get the the great DT2 place to go, right? I think it's DT2. Get to go to other countries. I don't know. My wife went through TPS a long time ago. I, I only know a little bit. Um, does anybody know the volumetric uh, um, measurement of air in here? How much volume's in there? It's more for yep. Okay, I always operate in uh, English units, but it's 100 cubic inches. Okay, where does it go to next? C kit. My handwriting is really poor, and it's probably small. Okay, so after the seat, where does it go? Regulator. That's absolutely right. And then it finally goes to your mask. So if my OBOGS goons up and I set an OBOGS degrade, based on this schematic that I just drew, where was the OBOGS signal set, the degrade signal set? Where in this pipeline? Right here. Before that error, that error that is at 23.9% equivalent, where does that error, um, when is it going to get to you? What does it have to work through? It has to work through a plenum, has to get through your seat, the hoses, then get to your regulator and get to your mask. So when you get that OBOX degrade, um, what I'm saying is, is you have about 10 to 60 seconds of high quality O2, much higher than you probably need, uh, that you're breathing before you're going to start experiencing or inspirating the air that's below the threshold of the alarm um, from the Crew 99, right? And so there's really two ways this OBOX can fail. So maybe we take a gander. No? Okay, so uh, the first one is bleed, bleed uh, uh, supply pressure um, uh, failing, right? We're not delivering bleed air to the OBOX to do its job and you can't breathe. And I'll talk about what that looks like. The second one, which uh, typically sets the OBOX degrade, is a rotary valve failure, right? Because now it's no longer cycling, now it's no longer using that pressure differential to concentrate the oxygen. I am just free flowing bleed air across the sieve. It's coming across the Crew 99 and saying, you've got an OBOX degrade and it's going to get to my mask. Is there another protection uh, in here on this diagram that I have not drawn yet that would be important? There is. Your cockpit is pressurized, right? And I told you, if you believe me, that the concentration of air doesn't change until you get to, to very, very high altitudes. So if you have a rotary valve failure on your OBOX, you're breathing cabin equivalent air. And typically we fly around 8,000 to 10,000 feet. When the system is working very well and you don't have a catastrophic failure like a, a dual bleed shutdown, um, it's exceedingly difficult to get yourself into a state where you would be talking about hypoxic hypoxia. Mask off at high altitudes can't help you. But when you're on the system, it's very robust. We took this entire system and we went to Brooks Air Force Base. It's one of the few places in the United States you can actually man rate equipment that goes into tactical aircraft. And we did unnatural things to it to try to trick the Crew 99 uh, and this setup to set up a physiologically significant condition where this wouldn't catch something here that could get you into trouble. It just wasn't possible. This was, in fact, faster than some of the lab instrumentation we had for setting off degrades. Don, one yes, quick sir. question. On this graph, before you change it, you said that we normally fly 8K, 10K. Yeah. Where on this graph is that, and is it adequate oxygen? It's right here. You can't probably see the numbers, but this is cabin altitude of uh, 8,000 feet. So you, know, you can see the equivalent of what you need is not very much above sea level. That's why you can fly in an airliner at 8,000 feet cabin pressure and not pass out. 
So your, you know, the line intersects right here, 20%, so that's 1% less than 21 intersects right there. You're well within adequate oxygenation, and then the OBOX warning actually kicks off much higher. That's why when we saw events come in and said, I had an OBOX degrade, and five seconds later I had symptoms, it didn't make a lot of sense. And we had to go back to, you know, looking at everything and with the input from the aeromedical professionals to say, it's probably not hypoxia, but that's all everybody ever has been taught. When you go into RBD, it's got to be hypoxia. It's the only way the system can get you. They don't talk about the other things that can happen that we're going to talk about. But the system is very robust. And so what do those failures look like? I've got data to show you that I'm not just making this up. Um, so in the top left here, we've got a rotary valve failure. Remember, the OBOX can no longer do its job to concentrate oxygen. Crew 99 immediately catches that condition when the, the rotary valve stops. And what you see in this green line is graceful degradation of the O2 at the mask to a baseline level of 21% oxygen. So you have plenty of time to execute your emergency procedures. It does not mean you are in instant danger when you get that O-box degrade. Not saying don't take it seriously, but what I'm saying is you have time to execute your procedures and you are in no clear and present danger. For the other way, bleed pressure disruption. If I remove bleed pressure from the aircraft, anybody ever have a bulge shut down? Not a, you have? Oh, I thought you shook your head. Uh, that's not a good thing. And you know those procedures are written in such a way that it makes sense we want you to go on emergency oxygen because your OBOG is no longer working. Crew 99 may or may not catch this condition, but you've got other things to worry about. You need to get on emergency oxygen, aviate, navigate, and communicate. What you will see happen, and these are breathing machines, um, is that you'll have a reduction in flow of the mask until you're basically sucking rubber. And at that point, it will be intolerable and you'll rip your mask off if you don't go on emergency oxygen. So there's, those are really only the two ways the OBOGs can do any sort of trickery. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about, which had been a theory that was purported by some folks in the Air Force, um, I thought that was going to make it funny, okay, uh, was that the concentrator could concentrate less than 21% oxygen equivalent. Right? The OBOX can't run backwards. It cannot concentrate lower than what ambient conditions are. So you're at a baseline, you're always going to have that, which is reflected in the data right here. Okay, so kind of pulling it all together, what's another thing that I haven't talked about in the lens of uh, hypoxic hypoxia? You know, we talked about duration for uh, contamination. What about exposure to a low pressure environment that you're breathing in? What's the other thing? It's in those handy uh, time of useful consciousness charts in your natops, right? They're not in there, but they will be. Um, you have to have a time on condition in order for this stuff to start to affect you, right? These time of useful consciousness charts, they don't even start till 18,000 feet. That's why we don't have skiers, you know, when they go up to some place where you ski, uh, wherever that is, uh, get in hypoxia. You have to be at very high altitudes. And the system does a great job with cabin pressurization, with a, a, a very good and robust oxygen monitor, and a system that is, uh, uh, does a really good job of producing O2 along with the plenum. It affords you a lot of protections in order for you to, to execute your emergency procedures. So, you know, kind of in summary, hypoxia, which, you know, your level A training before it's getting revamped had 25 slides dedicated to high altitude threats from hypoxia. Um, it's a danger but it is not the danger that's associated with PEs. We had very few events where we could say the person had hypoxia and, uh, and almost all of them, they were masked off at high altitude. So um, hopefully I've convinced you that we're not providing air that's poisoning you. Hopefully I've convinced you that the air we were providing you is adequate for uh, maintaining homeostasis in terms of the oxygen delivery. And uh, I've talked about what it's not, because that's as important as what it is, right? If I can't convince you I'm not poisoning you and that you have enough air to breathe, how could I ever talk to you about breathing? Did you guys uh, remember anything you got taught in your ground school about uh, breathing on closed loop systems like the F-18? You remember that portion of your ground school? You didn't have it, right? We don't talk or teach about breathing in a tactical aircraft. Uh, in the Navy, that's gonna change. And in fact, we don't really talk about breathing with anybody until I'm up here talking about it and then you start thinking about it. It's largely a subconscious process. And all of these different things can cause perturbations to this where it can go sideways very quickly. Um, you know, your harness, Doc touched on earlier about flight gear. What was the gouge about uh, wearing your flight gear? You wanted to have it cinched down as much as possible, right, in case you had to eject. What do you think that does to you? That's akin to chest wall strapping. And that changes your respiratory mechanics and how your body can ventilate 
um, your blood so that you get oxygen to tissue. It causes respiratory fatigue because you have to breathe against something. It changes your peak flows for how you breathe. And again, a lot of this is a subconscious process. Uh, your regulator. Uh, your regulator uh, can go sideways, right? Uh, you can, uh, it can flow too much, it can flow not enough. We're very sensitive to mass cavity pressures and the regulator is what drives that. The regulator is actually a pretty, pretty awesome piece of equipment. Um, your mask, how many like wearing the mask? The MU23, it's great, right? Not really. If we could fly without a mask, we probably would, but we have to have a mask in order to provide capability and we have to make physiological trade-offs to do that. Um, there's other things like thermal burden and just the fact of respiratory fatigue. You're, you're flying encumbered, you have a closed loop system that you're breathing on, uh, potentially you're wearing a dry suit, uh, you might have stressors, and you can start to see how all of this stuff stacks up to explain why you had a physiological episode because of these factors. Does that make sense? So does anybody want to tell me um, what their mask is made up of? What do you have in there? I'll give you the first one. You have an inlet valve, right? What's the other one? The outlet valve, the XL valve, yeah. What's this inlet valve connected to? There's a hose, right? And where does that hose go? To your rag. Am I missing anything up here? When you look at your mask, what else is there? Mic boom, man, that's the most important thing. Is there anything else? Okay, I'll draw it here in a second. So, um, how your system works. Your regulator um, provides air to you, right? Simple explanation. Provides what's called a, a safety pressure. There's a small amount of pressure that we apply in the mask. And what that does is to keep stuff from going in if you don't have a good mask seal. That's about one and a half inches of water. So inches of water is a, is a measurement of pressure. If I took an inch of water and I measured it, that's, that's the unit of measurement I'm talking about. So provides that when you breathe in, flapper valve opens, the air comes in, and at the peak of your, your breath, you start to expirate, right? And this flapper valve closes and you open up the exhalation valve. Have any of you guys ever flown with a sticky exhalation valve? You had to blow it out? That's when you noticed it. Right? There was likely, before then, a uh, buildup there that contributed to an expiratory load on your breathing. Okay? But you finally noticed it and you blew it out. In order to keep this valve closed, this exhalation valve, when we're providing that safety pressure or any type of pressure breathing for altitude, we have what's called a compensation tube that connects the exhalation valve to the inhalation valve. And what that basically does is it keeps this exhalation valve closed until you meet a cracking pressure that's greater than the line pressure here, okay? If this compensation valve comes loose, what do you think you're breathing against? What is the exhalation valve referencing? It's referencing your exhalation. You're breathing against yourself. You'll never open that exhalation valve, right? That's a severe case. You can kink this thing and it can cause problems and it raises what's called the expiratory loading on your breathing. Other things can go wrong uh, in terms of like FOD in the exhalation valve. So if you don't have a smooth stroke on your exhalation valve when you pre-flight your equipment, which I know you guys do every day, um, you can have uh, inlet valve leaks where a piece of FOD gets in there and the flapper doesn't sit correctly. And that can also look like an expiration valve uh, issue because of the way it works. So it's very important bottom line that you guys don't accept uh, uh, anything less than perfect for when you go fly with these pieces of equipment. Don't normalize deviance. If you have a problem, you need to gripe it and you need to get it fixed. Because if not, this little stuff can start to add up, especially in the context of the other stuff that I talked about. You know, you have to get to a really severe, severe uh, situation where this alone is gonna cause a PE. But if I make it dehydrated, if I give you atelectasis, and I start introducing expiratory loads, you're gonna have a bad day real quick. So what does that look like? Uh, this is uh, Vigilox flight test data from the world's greatest test squadron, VX-23. I have to say that because I'm PMA-265. Um, but uh, I'll walk you guys through these charts. So. Here is that inches of water measurement that I was talking about. You can think of that as the pressure that you have to breathe against or breathe in in order to uh, get air, right? Here is uh, peak flow in liters per minute. 
So that's the measurement of, of how much you're breathing. So if I have a higher peak flow, it means I'm more athletic breathing uh, versus just us breathing right now, okay? And what these dashed lines here are, are called trumpet curves, right? You want to be inside, when we design life support uh, system equipment, we want to make sure that we're inside of these trumpet curves because outside of it contributes to respiratory fatigue, okay? And so uh, there was no PE on this flight, but you could see with the Vigilox data, they were out of bounds for their expiratory loading. So is inspiration active or passive? Typically it's active. I, you know, I'm controlling how much I breathe in. Expiration is typically passive, right? Your intercostal, or I always screw up that word. Your body wants to get back to that point, right, for exhalation. When I start putting weight on here, it causes an issue. You have to do more work of breathing to overcome that resistance. That adds up to respiratory fatigue. And when I start getting respiratory fatigue or I have to accommodate an imposition, what do you think you change about how you breathe? you change the breathing rate. It probably increases for most normal human beings. And Doc's gonna talk about um, what the metabolic implications are of when I start breathing too fast. For this portion right here, uh, these are mass cavity pressure swings. So humans are exceedingly sensitive to mass cavity pressures or breathing in positions. Makes sense, right? That's the one thing we do uh, uh, every second of the day to keep ourselves alive. And anything impeding that uh, will cause us to, to not feel comfortable. Uh, what can happen is if I took the peak-to-peak -peak change in pressure for breathing and uh, I started oscillating that a whole bunch, I would get the sensation of breathing resistance. How many of you ever heard of a PE or I said, hey, it was just like my uh, ROBD training. I, f I felt air hunger. That's what that looks like if this is severe enough. Air hunger or a flow restriction can cause that. So uh, these are places that we don't want to be. And uh, it's really important, you know, I'll flip stop and again, it's your gear, your life. You got to make sure that it works right. And we're also doing things to get the PRs trained up to look for this kind of stuff, uh, to make sure that the flight gear looks right so you're not chest wall strapping yourself. You're not putting yourself in a position um, where you're going to get sick. Now let's go back to the things we talked about before earlier in the uh, brief. And we, we added a few and I took out a couple and combined them. So these are, Again, physiologic margin is what you have to have to compensate that negative cockpit environment to you physiologically. So the margin degraders and also how it affects your breathing. Dehydration is very significant for G-tolerance. So um, if you tactically dehydrate, you're getting into the cockpit about 1% to 2% decreased body weight of water. It only takes up to 3% to lose 40% of your G-tolerance. You want to be hydrating prior to flight I wouldn't drink like 24 ounces right before a flight, but you know you want to be hydrating throughout the day, and you want to be hydrating in the cockpit, especially if you're going to fly for longer than an hour. If you're flying for an hour and you're hydrated getting into the cockpit, you're probably fine. I would still bring some water just in case, but uh, if you're in there for longer than an hour and you're not drinking, you're doing yourself a disservice, and you're not going to be at your best. Flight gear, we talked about that. What does it do to you? So who can breathe at their deepest and largest breath in flight gear. Anyone? If, if you say yes, you're wearing it way too loose. Most of you are probably wearing it way too tight. And that's taking away your ability to breathe deeply. So if you have a low level of oxygen going to your brain or your t at the tissue level, your body's first compensatory mechanism is to start breathing deeper. Not faster, because your body's smart. It doesn't want you to lose CO2. That's bad. So it's going to start breathing deeper. Um, and that cannot be done in your flight gear effectively. So your body automatically kicks over to its secondary compens compensation mechanism, which is an increase in rate, okay? So that increase in rate occurs. That means you're going to start losing CO2, maybe not at a significant level, but more than what you're, you have in your, your body here sitting in this room. And then you're going to have lo loss of lung volume because you just can't get that expansion, you know? You go from six liters maybe down to five and a half or five is your, is your, your max lung expansion. Mass breathing, we talked about that extensively. Increase worker breathing, increase respiratory rate. Again, that's going to also drive CO2 down. And these are all things just that normally happen in the cockpit. This is not anything you're doing wrong. 
than anything you're, you're, you're actively doing. It's just, it's the situation you're in. Breathing gas. So 94% oxygen, 6% argon. Guess what's not in that air at all? Nitrogen. What keeps your lungs expanded at the alveolar level? Nitrogen. So when you breathe OBOGs, about 10 to 15 minutes into flight, you are now prone to have progressive atelectasis and you're sitting and you're in flight gear. So uh, there's been studies that have been done to show that your lung volume uh, and your lung capacity can comp uh, decrease anywhere from five to 10% all the way up to almost 40% depending on your, your body size, your height, just your, your lung capacity. And then if you smoke, which is probably the dumbest thing you could do and go fly, um, now you're really hurting yourself. So all of those things are setting you up for uh, less optimally functioning lungs and you have less lung capacity. Sitting position, again, we talked about that earlier. That's taking out the lower part of your lung, just compressing them when you're sitting down and you're losing lung volume, causing atelectasis in the lower lobes. Uh, altitude, when you're really high, it's more of an effect. You have the oxygen to mitigate that. But again, the higher you go, the more of a perfect lung you need to have. Okay, and your lungs are already at somewhat of a negative. So that's why we really emphasize you being in just absolute tip top shape to go fly. Temperature, increase, what happens when you get into a hot tub? Really, really hot, hot tub. Does your heart rate go up or down? Goes up, naturally, just normal. That drives your respiration rate to go up as well because your heart is demanding more oxygen, okay? And you are blowing off more heat by breathing faster, right? You get rid of you get rid of, uh, you compensate for that temperature change by breathing off heat. What happens to your mask when you breathe into it for a while? It gets wet and it gets hot. Okay, so increased temperature, not always there, but if you're flying at Key West in July, probably going to be an effect. And then what else happens? Because you're breathing more, you're, you're getting rid of more uh, water vapor, you're also sweating, loss of water. Again, we're down here. So temperature is going to affect pH as well. So now let's look at all of those things from a biochemical standpoint to uh, get more after what those are. So up here at the top, we have CO2 and water. That's on one side of the equation, okay? That's more in the lung area. And then over here, you have bicarb, uh, bicarbonate and uh, your hydrogen ion. That's driving your blood pH. And in the middle, you have something your body hates to be together, which is carbonic acid. So there's not a lot of carbonic acid in your body, but that's how the things go in the chemical equation. One thing that's important to know is that the carbonic acid fluctuates in a linear fashion. The other two sides go in a parabolic fashion. So if you drive one of these down or up significantly to get across to the compensation mechanism, it's a linear, but you can change this parabolically. So that's how you can get yourself into a negative and it takes a while to get it back to normal. Um, what we just talked about, bottom line down here, is it's setting you up for a situation called respiratory alkalosis. So however you get there, and there's multiple pathways, and you lose enough CO2, you will be in what's called respiratory alkalosis. Dehydration causes metabolic alkalosis. So if you go into the cockpit in, a, in, a, in an alkalotic state of significant dehydration, to get to respiratory alkalosis, it, it's, a small, it's a small tick. And it really doesn't matter which one's higher or lower because of these three things, what is causing the symptoms in the brain and at the uh, tissue level? Which, which of these changes is significantly causing your symptoms? pH. So change in pH, especially elevated pH is what we're dealing with here. Who said paresthesia is tingling in your fingers? That's high pH. That's what causes that, okay? The only other way you're gonna get that is if you compress your nerve. Like if you, you know, if you lean on, your, rest on your elbow for a while, you start getting numbness and tingling in your fifth and fourth digit. That's because you're compressing your nerve, your ulnar nerve at your elbow. So high pH, that's causing that symptom you're, just, you're talking about. Uh, hypoxia and hypocapnia um, or elevated blood pH, respiratory alkalosis, both ultimately, whether it's from lack of oxygen or whatever the cause, are gonna ultimately cause cerebral hypoxia. So the reason for that is 
What do we talk about that occurs because you're breathing high levels of oxygen? Vasoconstriction, right? So there's low flow initially going to the brain. What does elevated pH do? Causes vasoconstriction. Does that get canceled out just because this is doing it? No, it's compounded. So you have two, two separate pathways causing vasoconstriction. What else does pH do uh, to the molecule that's transporting oxygen, which is hemoglobin? It causes it to change shape, and now as opposed to wanting to give oxygen to the tissue, it holds on to it like it's its newborn baby, and it won't let it go. So when the hemoglobin travels through the brain, now in a vasoconstrictive you know, less amount, it won't release the oxygen. So when you get into this state, and again, you have a lot of things set up against you initially that can get you there. This is not your baseline state, getting into the cockpit, but if you have a mask problem, if you have um, a flight gear problem, if you come in to the cockpit with uh, energy drinks, or we had somebody who recently had a PE who was taking a supplement that lowered their blood pressure, I have no idea why you would do that and go fly. Um, if it's really high temperature, you've been flying for two hours, uh, then the breathing gas, you can't really change, right? You, you, you don't get to dial that in. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of things, and the, the longer you sit in the cockpit, the worse, it can, this, worse this can get, where you can get a low enough CO2 that it'll drive that pH, you'll lose enough of the hydrogen, uh, ion to where you drive that pH high enough to where you start getting symptomatic. So you'll see a lot of the changes we're doing for uh, emergency procedures and other things where you start getting a little symptomatic when some of these things happen, as opposed to keeping on, staying on your mask and breathing 100% oxygen, because why would I want further vasoconstriction? You're actually going to be told to you know, take off your mask, check it, control your depth and rate of breathing, and just kind of just you know, count it out. And you may not even notice how fast you're breathing. But it's a natural, involuntary process that usually gets you to that state. And because you're so close to this to begin with, it doesn't take much. If you, if you start getting really active in the cockpit, you're pulling a lot of Gs, you've got other things going on, maybe you have a couple EPs going off, your body's me metabolic rate and just your overall ability to really compensate for that, kind of just the margin degrades, degrades, degrades. And then if you're dehydrated, the further you are in flight, the easier that's going to happen. So this is why we really harp on hydration, nutrition, sleep, is that we want you to be able to not get to this state for the entire flight. And it's very easy to do that if you're in a proper physical state. Now, if, you're, if you have a massive mask failure, you know, that's one thing. But that is rarely what happens. There's almost always a human factor, something that the aviator brought into the cockpit that made them more susceptible. Now, again, we're talking about AOS PEs, right? We said that's half of it. Of all these things, when you're talking about pressure-related PEs, when that ECS system causes those fluctuations, again, the one thing that it protects you the best from harm is staying hydrated, OK? Um, so that's why hydration is best for uh, mitigation for both peas. And then human factors, too, for those things. The better shape you're in, the better. And then some of them just come. Who played high school or college uh, contact sports? Anybody? So just like in the NFL, the more concussive effects you have, the more uh, head trauma you have, whether it's minor or not, it's cumulative through life. Anybody know about the U-2 pilots study in the Air Force? What do they, ha what do they have after, you know, hours and hours of flight in that aircraft. They don't really notice it, but you can see it on an MRI. Right. Yeah, white matter in the brain. So there's, that's scarring. So there's small little thing. Now that's really high altitude flight. Naval aviators don't have that. But when you have a head, head trauma, uh, let's say you were a, quarter, a quarterback in college and you took a bunch of concussive hits, okay? You were probably playing for Army as their quarterback, right? But um, uh, you can not right away, but 10 years later, do an MRI of that person, you'll probably find some white matter uh, because they had some minor hits, and those are cumulative. But the number one thing you can do in the cockpit to prevent that from ever happening, again, is to stay away from this equation and stay up there. And the best thing you can do, again, is stay hydrated, less physical stress, nutrition, sleep. That's why we harp on those things all the time. It's not just 
a broken record. It is really your essential way to stay at that physiologic margin to tolerate the environment you're in. And then, you know, the key thing is that when you get into that situation where you have high pH, low CO2, your body's ability to fix that takes days. So again, I said that equation to go between is linear, whereas the others can go parabolic. So if, you, if I had a volunteer, and I don't want one because you guys are all in flight status, um, could I get somebody hypoxic or hypocapnic quicker? Which can you get to quicker? So I could, we could easily do an experiment. You do 30 seconds on your watch, hold your breath. You're going to get symptomatic? You shouldn't, especially if you have decent breathing. You can probably hold your breath for a good minute and not get really symptomatic. You may feel like you need to breathe, but you're not going to get a headache. You're not going to get, you're not going to get tingling in your fingers. You can, I could get anybody to come up and hyperventilate for 20 to 30 seconds, and they would have most of those symptoms. That could happen just like that, if you wanted to do it. But it's, it can also happen insidiously. We had a PE where a guy was flying locks. He had the selector. For some reason, the maintenance department put in the selector, the old selector that had intermediate flow uh, as an option. Uh, not sure why they did that, because it was already taken out of the aircraft at the time. He flew the whole time with that in intermediate. So the flow to the mask was very low. And after 60, 70 minutes in flight, he was hypocapnic because his breathing rate had slowly gotten faster and faster and faster. We actually did a blood gas on him to prove it. His pH was very high and his CO2 was very low. Oxygen was normal because, and he wasn't breathing emergency oxygen because your, your brain wants this. It will sacrifice this and this to stay happy here. Um, that's, that's some of the mechanisms. So it actually takes your kidneys to dump bicarb to fix this problem, and that takes days. So again, we talked about uh, dehydration. Dehydration, the reason that it, it causes an increase in pH is because it actually dumps bicarb from the tissue into the blood. So now you have in the blood what you need to get rid of to fix the problem at, at a higher level. It's another reason dehydration is so bad. And then a lot of times what we used to do with PE aviators is say, okay, you got a PE, we're going to see how you do, but we didn't really do a good follow-up. We didn't give you 72 hours to recover like we do now with the clinical practice guidelines. Because the worst thing you can do is get back in the cockpit, experience that environment again, get dehydrated, you know, not sleep, do a bunch of duty time, uh, basically normal carrier ops. So now if you have a PE flight and you're symptomatic, we're going to follow you for 72 hours, make sure you get asymptomatic, and the moment you're asymptomatic, you go back up. But what we don't want to do is have that compounding effect to make things worse. And we want this situation to occur. So if you talk about ECS, pressure-related PEs, concussive effects, the worst symptomatic time period is that 48 to 72 hour period. It takes a while for the symptoms to develop. This usually gets symptomatic early on and then it, it degrades over two to three days. But in no case should you ever expect the next morning to feel perfectly normal. That's just not going to occur. And you can feel worse. So you, there's been a lot of PEs where somebody said, I feel worse the next day. Or I feel worse, I feel, I feel the same way two days later. That's completely normal. Your body is, is, is working it out. Okay? But that's why we, as flight docs, will see you for the first 72 hours. Now, at 72 hours, this should be resolved. And at 72 hours, if you had an ECS hit bad enough, where you're still significantly symptomatic, that's when we're going to get you to those specialists uh, at the uh, Intrepid Spirit Centers and at the Tampa VA and make sure you get that rehabilitation for the concussive effect so it doesn't turn into a long-term issue. And you can get back up in weeks, not months or years. And ultimately, the best thing you can do, again, is human factors are your number one margin degrader. So again, going to the cockpit, hydrated, well-fed, uh, with a lot of with sleep, and, and in a flight bubble the best you can. So cabin pressurization. Uh, fluctuations can range from things such as triggers. I, I hear something that happened uh, to causing uh, bear trauma, which is in line with uh, first principles of aerospace and dive physiology, um, to aviation DCS, and then to the new um, line of thinking about concussive injuries. 
So it causes these fluctuations from an aircraft and engineering perspective can kind of break down to a couple things I alluded to earlier. There are subsystems uh, that were not adequately designed um, that when not well maintained could cause issues. For example, in the legacy systems, we had the cabin air exit system. Does anybody remember what that was? I know uh, ZDAC does. Uh, but we're ripping that out of the legacy aircraft because it introduces perturbations to uh, the cockpit environment. Um, however, bottom line, when the, the aircraft is well maintained, uh, the jet will take care of you and it will perform very well. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Doc to talk about you know, why it's not DCS and what else it could be. So thank you for your time. The bottom line is everybody in this room has normal blood pressure. Again, I'm assuming that because you're in flight status. Okay? So your blood pressure is what's protecting you from having bubbles come out of solution. Okay, so. Uh, nitrogen is, again, the bubble that is notorious with um, DCS. And um, at low altitudes, your blood pressure is protective. It actually prevents it from coming out of solution. So this is a graph that we actually borrowed from the British. Um, and this is their DCS wrist map. So cabin altitude is at the top. This chart doesn't even start till 18K. And that's a conservative value. So you know, if you look at a lot of uh, FAA material and older aerospace medicine material when it was all guys flying and no females, because females usually have a lower blood pressure than males because they're a lot more chill. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, females just on average have a lower blood pressure. So we've kind of looked at that, that flight altitude and said we want a safer value for everyone who's flying. Um, so we're going to pick you know, 18K. And that's, that's really down at the low, low limits of where you can even think of DCS occurring. So that's where your blood pressure is no longer protective. That's where nitrogen can come out of solution and cause those bubbles to form. Uh, and then again, time is significant. So what happens if all of a sudden you're, you're, you're at 18K and um, you, know, you lose pressure in your cockpit? Does that necessarily mean you automatically have DCS? No. The longer you stay in that environment, the worse it gets. Okay, and the higher the cabin altitude and the flight level, the more risk you can have. But it takes time. So again, it's not it's not automatic. We had a we had a marine aviator, if you remember, a few years back, who was at high altitudes, who just had his canopy go poop, depart the aircraft. Okay, he didn't get DCS. He was able to land the aircraft, sans canopy, no problems. He actually, I think, went to the gym later that day. So again, it's, it's, not a, it's not some magical altitude level where all of a sudden bubbles just pour out of your body and you now have an embolism and you know, it, it's a problem. But again, it has to be at a very high altitude. So again, that's why we did the studies at the Naval Experimental Dive Unit. We did studies at, at, at uh, NAMRU-D, the uh, Aerospace Medical uh, Research Lab in Dayton. And we found no evidence that you know, 100 plus years of knowledge about DCS was wrong and that somehow the F-18 was tricking that into getting it to occur at low levels. Uh, and primarily, again, it goes back to the aviator. The aviator has always been the constant in DCS. Your blood pressure protects you. You cannot get a 5K DCS. So if you're flying around at, at 5,000 foot, 10,000 foot, you cannot get DCS. Now again, we go back to margin degrader. So 18K is a really conservative upper limit of where it can start. Can that drop down a little bit? Sure. If you have had multiple flights that day, if you have a long time at altitude, oh, there's our friend dehydration. So if you're really dehydrated, sure, you can get DCS at a little lower altitude. And I mean a little, not down to like 8K. Recent injuries, because that's going to cause infl inflammation in your body, inflammation in your uh, arteries, and that's going to allow uh, the bubbles to come out of solution uh, uh, quicker. And then recent exposure to pressure change. So everybody knows you can't go dive and then four minutes later jump in the cockpit. Okay, because that's going to cause the likelihood of DCS to go up a lot. So, and again, we didn't have a bunch of aviators who went diving, jumped in the cockpits, and that's how PE started. Okay, in fact, none of them are associated with dive incidents. And then here are the patients that were at Tampa VA. So on the left-hand side are a summary of hundreds and hundreds of patients they've seen from Afghanistan, Iraq, who've had typical TBI concussive effects. Um, they all have a prior history of concussion, most of them, 
because again, that makes you susceptible for that next hit to be significant. So you, your body can take hit after hit after hit at some point, and everyone has their own mark, you will not be able to take another hit or it will cause symptoms. Are those symptoms always permanent? No, most of them can be here really rehabilitated back to normal or baseline. Same thing with our PE aviators who've had multiple ECS PEs and had chronic symptoms. Every single one of them had prior history of concussion pre-Navy. How many of them marked that on their 2807? Not a single one. But uh, we had honest conversations offline. You no, know, no harm, no foul. Come on, tell me, tell me what your life was like. And one of them had had a lot of concussions prior to coming in the Navy. Um, neuroimaging, so non-specific white matter. We talked about the U2 pilots. What is that from? This. So again, you can tell these people had significant injury pre-Navy because it takes years for this to occur. Um, and they had that. And this is plus or minus, because you've got to remember, this energy change in ECS system is mild, very mild, or it's repetitive. These could be roadside bomb, or it could be something concussive. It's a lot more of a one-time effect. So they don't necessarily have um, the chance to get the scarring because they don't have that cumulative effect. It's a one-time hit. Vestibular, and this should really say ocular motor. These are the two symptoms that you get and TBI concussive patients that you also see in PE aviators. So the ones that went to the chamber a bunch or went to a lot of chamber uh, runs, I think we had some PE aviators who went for 60 or 80 runs. These things, this VA, Tampa VA evaluation was done after that. Okay, and they still had these things. That's because this is almost like a reset and you have to go through rehabilitation and training to get it back to the baseline. Or in some cases, it just takes time, like with a concussion. What's the NFL protocol? How do they medically treat concussion in the NFL? Right, they don't. It's just two weeks off. It's two weeks, no games, right? Because there is no treatment. Time is your actual best treatment. Now, there's things you can do to get it going faster. Again, hydration, rest, proper nutrition, rehabilitate yourself. And then with some of these things, you would just go, you go through rehabilitation, and it gets back to normal. So these are eye issues. These are... He, uh, peripheral hearing issues, um, and all the aviators who went to Tampa VA, who went through their program, some of them it took longer, some of them it took less amount of time, all got back to baseline where I, as a flight surgeon, can tell NAMI, this is no longer an issue, let them fly. Okay, Hyperbaric oxygen treatments never got any of them close to there, nor would it have, because it's not treating the problem, because there's no bubbles. There's no embolic event. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment only will we reverse bubbles that form and get them back into solution. That's ex so that's what the chamber's for, right? We have bubbles that form, you rush them into the chamber, and you push the bubbles back into solution. Okay? So if you have significant concussive or TBI effects, again, th the reason they don't have a chamber at Tampa VA is because early on they found out that was a mistake. It was making people worse. Uh, so at low level, mild uh, concussions, does it cause a problem? No. It, you have to be a pretty severe case, but we also know it's not effective, so why do it? Let's get people into the rehabilitation that they need to get up as fast as possible. So um, any questions on any of that? Uh, for any of the team, happy to uh, answer your questions or expound on anything. Just, just wanted to make sure that all of you know that um, if anybody does have a significant uh, ECS uh, PE in the future, our avenue to get you to care is days. And they come to BUMED directly. So all the, oh, I need to go to Flight Dock here and get a consult, that has to be approved at Pax River CO's office, and then that goes to the region, and then that goes to somebody at DHA, and all that's, no. They just call me, I put in the paperwork, it's already approved automatically for PE aviators, it goes to Tampa, they say yes, and you, you get funded to go there.